Thank you, Kelsey. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are in the Community Development Standing Committee of Tuesday, June 6, uh, 2017. Hakum Kuala, please welcome us. Welcome to Homish, Oweo Mill. Welcome to the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. There is an agenda in front of the committee. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda, moved by Council Pryor, seconded by Council Race. All those in favor, opposed, carries. Uh, the minutes from the um, Community Development Center Committee meeting of May 2nd is in front of the committee. Um, I'm looking for a motion to approve, moved by Council Kent, seconded by Councillor Pryor. All those in favor, opposed, motion carries. Is there any business arising from that? Seeing none, uh, our first item of business is a laneway developments and maintenance. Uh, this came up as a conversation from um, a DP application a couple weeks ago when we were talking about um, a, a development on 2nd Avenue and the laneway and the interface of the laneway and a whole bunch of laneway issues came up so we thought it was about time we had a conversation uh, about it. Um, I'm wondering, Jonas, do you want to frame this a little bit, maybe talk a little bit about Current policies on laneway, um, um, from the setbacks and laneways, uh, homes, um, <coughs> parking, maybe even a little bit, I don't know, maybe Gary, um, maintenance. A lot of our lanes are gravel. I just thought it would be a good opportunity for us to talk about uh, laneways, uh, considering we're going to get a lot of, um, I suspect, um, applications that are going to be on laneway. Yeah, I can uh, have a talk about it. Yes. Um, so our uh, downtown is really the only area where we have quite a few laneways. Um, they are all six meters wide. Um, they are the purpose of the laneways is to provide access, uh, to take the, away the access traffic from the street frontage and put it in the back. Um, you can't park your vehicle in in a laneway, uh, but you can park your vehicle on the property. Uh, so there's no setback requirement for um, from the laneway for parking. Um, the only setback requirements we do have is when the laneway um, joins or um, intersects the street. Uh, for visibility, there's a bit of a um, setback. Um, the C4 zone, which is the predominant zone downtown, does have a setback for buildings, and that's 3.5 meters. And that is the setback that uh, the district is looking at potentially um, adjusting uh, to do with the setback at the street frontage. So it's the part of the long bus amendments that are still in process to move the building envelope back towards the laneway. Um, and that's, um, I think, pretty much sum summarizes the, the, the situation we're in right now. Uh, just a clarification question, I'll go to Councilor Chappelle. So if someone's um, got a home, they have a setback from the rear lot line for the home, but for a, a laneway uh, carriage house suite, there's, you can build right to the lot line? The carriage house is, is not right to the lot line, but it's, it's less than a meter. Yeah, yeah okay. Yes. Uh, Susan, then Ted. Thanks. I'd like to frame this conversation in a different way, is that previously our laneways were to get traffic off the road. And the opposite has happened is that, uh, you know, when we lived in the front of our house and looked out onto the streets and it was paved in the front, there's tons of cars, there's tons of traffic, it's through fares, um, and we can't have our kids playing out there because there's so much traffic, as well as car infrastructure, and that's as it should be. Those roads are paved, there's shitty parking for people's homes. When we moved to the back and moved into a laneway where it was not paved, we noticed children playing, people walking past our house on a regular basis, people using the laneways for pedestrian traffic. And I don't know in my time in Squamish if I, have besides places that have been built with sidewalks, if the district has ever put in or maintained sidewalks in downtown Squamish. And I thought, and Patty has also said this, that there are better ways to, instead of just like making everybody go out on the street, what if we made our laneways into pedestrian spaces, not remove traffic, still have laneway traffic, but make it 20 kilometers an hour, and slow roads, it's permeable surfaces, not pave them, but make them into 
pleasant places for people to walk and, and because there's with lanes, you can get on a laneway to everywhere in downtown. You can walk down Fifth Avenue, you can walk all the way across the park, you can walk through to the parks, and that's the natural flow of people's pathways now is through the laneways because there's just so much less traffic. And those roads are going to get busier and busier with densification. And my question to myself was, would it be possible to set the laneways aside for pedestrian traffic, allow pedestrian pathways as people build laneways to their cars out front and leave the streets that are quite wide for parking of vehicles and traffic and leave the laneways for the people's space. That was my, and, and a lot of different developments have been, uh, it's just interesting to see what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Councilor Chappell brought up a number of issues as did Jonas. So, there's a lane week treatment, currently they're gravel mostly, so I think perhaps talking about what the vernacular is going to look like, uses, pedestrian, cyclist, car, uh, slow roads, um, parking, although it sounds like we don't allow parking at the moment, you can park on your own property but not lane, just not wide enough I'm assuming, and maybe setbacks, and I'm sure there's other pieces, but heading into um, I'm going to just back up. When you talked about the streets that are doing the setbacks, that's just certain streets, right? That's right. Yeah, because that's for where we want our bike lanes. Yes. Um, and then, so a lot of the lanes, I mean, I'm, I've always favored the downtown and back alleys. That's why I'm downtown. So I know there would be potentially all sorts of really interesting things. that's already being done, really. I mean, like Susan says, people do use them for sauntering down to the pub or, and, and as a building owner with back alleys, you know, you can heavily rely on the back alleys for parking and shipping and receiving and garbage cans. Um, I think that if the development world knew there was an opportunity focus energy into the back alleys, a lot of places don't do so. Um, I don't think there's an easy fix because we have to have a strategy and plan and a lot of that stuff. But I do see you know, the back alleys as a super connector. <clears throat> business, you can have business. Yeah, thanks. Um, I grew up in a, in a house with a lane in Point Grey, and, and uh, all the houses in that neighborhood had lanes, and it was gravel. It was never paved when I was there. Um, but the city used to come along and the dust attenuation. Sometimes they'd spray down oil or something like that, uh, which was not the neatest stuff, but uh, it kept the dust down. Um, and oddly enough, uh, about a year or so ago, there was an article in the Vancouver TV media about coach houses and carriage houses and so forth, and that particular street that I lived on was highlighted, and practically the whole block has <coughs> a series of carriage houses going down the back alley, and now the alley's paved, and so it's almost like another street, uh, and the neighbors were a little bit upset about the density and so forth, but for me, you know, when you look at the places with lanes, um, that for me is a better place to have carriage houses than where we've been putting them, uh, which is where we don't have lanes and the back fences and the lots of butt to each other, because suddenly you find yourself with somebody else's carriage house kind of parked right in your back fence, and it alters the dynamic of the neighborhood a little bit, and so it's a little bit more problematic. At least the lane gives you a buffer to uh, the next property, which is on the other side of the lane, you know, 16, 20 feet away. So I think it's appropriate for that. Um, Take the point you don't want. It is also a great place for kids on bikes, um, walking, um, all that kind of stuff. And so I think I would not want to start a program of paving them, uh, particularly, because that just encourages speed. Um, dust attenuation is something I think we would want to do. 
consider if they're not paved. And also traffic calming. Uh, but I think generally they're a good place for the secondary suites, the coach houses and the carriage houses, those types of neighborhoods. Uh, they lend themselves well to that, I think. Because there's no room to put a driveway down the size of these lots. They're, like, they're just way really too small. So just leave it with those comments. So I'm wondering, um, I need to break these down so we're focusing on some questions. And maybe we'll just get a bit of a, a witness test from everybody. Um, we all agree that these should be slow roads, that these are you know, it's basically 20K an hour roads. Or under. That's something that everyone envisions for. Is that pretty standard, to be honest? Yes, because they're narrow, they're narrow roads. Um. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if we maybe talk a little bit about design. I, you know, I, I think we don't want to get into necessarily paving them, but there might be um, a different vernacular we, we want to look at designing our laneways, whether it's green with, you know, gravel for the road, for the, or cement for the, you know, push carriages and car tires, or some other look to them, and I know there's costs involved in that. What other things can we think about in terms of what a laneway Look like, especially if we start to get um, more territorial suites. Um, so there are different alternative designs that could be uh, applied. Uh, one that comes to mind immediately is the advisory lanes, where you have a single vehicle lane down the middle, and then you've got um, pedestrian and cycling lanes on the sides. And they usually they work well for narrow roads in slow traffic areas. Um, there could the, there could be alternative designs that we could look at, but that would require paving. The it might not require paving. It, it, it could be a greenway with um, you know, looks like a greenway, like it's actually grass in the middle with two cement where car wheels can go. Um, I, I'm not so sure. Go to Gary in two seconds. I'm not so sure I'm looking at trying to make lane, like a, a bike lane and a bike lane or a pedestrian lane and a bike lane. I think it just should be all shared use, but you create the urban design that actually keeps the vehicle slow. Maybe there's traffic calming. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at, I'm trying to get the conversation about some sort of vernacular. But what is, what's, the, what's the language of a laneway in particularly the downtown? There's some other laneways in Brackenville and such, but especially as you get more and more people living off the back of the lane. Yeah, there's sort of a, a division here between lanes that are accessed for commercial properties are going to be problematic because the, and we are having those paved and being on the same point. So the, the gravel just doesn't stand up to that that traffic. So I think there's there's a lot more difficulty in, in alternate treatments for commercial the rear of commercial properties. You've got garbage access. You've probably got parking access. Um, you've got heavier vehicles. Lanes that are in sort of residential downtown, I think, are where there are some this greater liberty to sort of entertain sort of these more um, pedestrian based. It's going to be very difficult to do sort of between two commercial properties and, and try and accommodate that level, that type of traffic. Um, but, but but the residential lane downtown in Brackenbury. That sort of bank sort of a, I mean, there's the Vuna, that Dutch mm -hmm. narrow, soft street that sort of hits a pedestrian space but it allows vehicles. There's that concept to, that we could implement or introduce into the subdivision development on coal or the residential areas. Again, I'll warn people not to Google naked streets on this. <laughs> Don't actually get. Thank you. Really, 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 really. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin, Susan. Well, I was just going to you know, mention what Gary did there is that, you know, like there is a few back alleys in Brackenville and they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. But the downtown is made up of like three streets with residential and the rest are all commercial. And I know in the like, industrial area, if you develop your requirement. It's, it's a 
very small segment. You know, so we're looking at a very tiny, specific area when we talk about these back alleys. It's not like it's, it's not a big issue. So uh, a lot of the houses over here now are not only going for carriage houses, they're going for subdivisions, which was something that I always thought would be interesting in subdividing these lots if you can get four lots. Four tiny homes creates affordable housing. So that was something that I brought up a couple years ago. But, uh, it's only a few streets, and as people are coming in with bigger, you know, they, they have a. There's one in front of us, I think, right now that's got a subdivision plan in front of that. Yes, the duplex is on the yeah. farm. And so that's, you're starting to use the back alley. <coughs> years ago to put paving stones in the back alley and was turned down because the district doesn't like paving stones because so when the snow plow comes they catch a paving stone. Um. massive streets and currently right now because there's no parking in the alleyway if you have guests or anything other than your car you have to park in the front anyways so and there is enough parking there's lots of parking in the front there's uh most of the neighbors haven't we haven't had that issue of parking yet and the whole and the downtown is intensifying with uh um you know the end of fifth and the new development going on down there but the streets are becoming so crowded because people are you know, you think about a single family home, but there are, because of our housing issue and zero vacancy, uh, we're having the same issues as Dawson Creek had when they thought densification was an amazing idea, which, you know, is definitely suited for a lot of neighborhoods, but they didn't imagine pe three people with three cars coming to their neighborhood, so they had huge parking issues. And so it's basically just about leaving the streets for streets and cars and leaving the back alley for pedestrians, and we still will have. Lately, I agree with Doug that they're the perfect place for densification for alleyways, but people will still have to park in the front on the road, and there's lots of parking to do so. So if you have a house in the back, having a pathway to the back of the house, you need access there anyways. It's not, and that doesn't mean that you can't have a garage that fits a car, but it just means it's a slower road, and that you recognize that these laneways are going to be paved and are going to maintain natural. They're already beautifying. People are now putting gardens and uh, uh, like uh, there a lot of the densification is putting their gardens in the back alleyways, which is really nice as well. So it's just something to be conscious of as we densify. Is we're not going to be put the sidewalks are the most expensive thing, and I'm very conscious of the fact we only have a seven hundred thousand dollar active transportation budget. It's probably not going to go to having sidewalks in the downtown and doing it one house by one house and putting in paving stones one house is also probably not going to happen. But if you leave the pedestrian spaces in the back where people have access and you're conscious of that in your housing design, uh, then you have naturally created uh, safe pedestrian spaces. And it is like watching the three-year-olds learn to like, ride their bike back there is amazing. And they can't do it. We're used to do it on the road, even though it's a dead end. We have cars speeding up and down there all the time now. So it's just uh, watching how the neighborhoods are, are changing and making sure that we still have access to parks and green space in the downtown is, is really important. So um, I'll go to Karen, uh, and then I want to actually put some focus on, on the problem. Karen. Um, I haven't given a lot of thought to the residential laneways, but um, I think around the commercial buildings, um, it's a great opportunity. I know that staff have been working with developers to lead cut-throughs so to create connectivity, um, and also the idea that uh, commercial uh, and cafes don't just need to happen on the main streets, but they can be tucked into those side um, alleys and also in the back lanes. Um, and sometimes for Squamish, it's not a bad idea because of the wind that 
USA has a few interesting places to get to that are off of the industry. So I don't know if any developers would be interested in that, but certainly I lived six years in a city that used all of its commercial landmates, not all of them, but most of them for restaurants, shops, which has created a more commercial density um, and very interesting um, opportunities for restaurants and cafes um, because you would be creative with the smaller space. And a lot of them just ended up fully covered and took people out of the elements even though they were outdoors because they were open at both ends. Um, the, the buildings would cover that laneway so you could sit outside in the winter and have some coffee. But you're still getting fresh air through the laneway. So it's just sort of turning our mind to maybe being creative in the commercial sense of creating more opportunities for commercial space. So, um, interesting conversation. So, what it, it sounds like there's going to be a bit of a new uh, design guideline, if you want to call it that, for laneways like the one behind the main between Cleveland and 2nd Avenue, and how, I guess my concern or my thought is that as soon as we do that laneway, other people that back on the laneway are gonna go, is that what my laneway's gonna look like? I don't want my lane to look like that, or I do want my lane to look like that. So if we can get out in front to sort of articulate that we're gonna do this type of design on laneways that back onto commercial areas, so maybe in the second, and uh, laneways and residential neighbors will have a, a different vernacular uh, while still always maintaining um, that their human space is for walking, biking. Cars that are in those should be going 10, maximum 20 kilometers an hour, and we need to figure out how we're going to sign that, how we're going to traffic control the laneways. Um, I think we all, especially on those commercial areas, want to see that eclectic, you know, we don't want to sanitize the laneways. We don't want them to become just another road. We want them to be eclectic, intimate spaces uh, that people feel comfortable and safe on, but are also, you know, interesting. So I'm not sure how, I just, I thought it was worthwhile having this conversation before we all of a sudden get our first paved laneway and then people start to create an expectation in their mind and they may not want it or they may want it. So, um, yeah, Tim. Well, I was just going to say also, through going walkways, so we can have a walkway connecting the alley through. And that's what Karen said, yeah. So I think connectivity is a really important piece of all those blocks that we have that people to be able to so, walk through. So for a next step, I mean, we have this conversation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Would we be contemplating things like reduction in parking because you're going to have a commercial frontage up front and then a commercial frontage up back? It's still based on it's still based on square feet, so they would still have the back alleys are used predominantly for parking or getting access to your parking. There's no parking access, 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 to, parking. access to, but it wouldn't reduce unless we were trying to improve something. But they wouldn't get a parking reduction. It would be based on square foot here. Where a carriage house goes, the carriage house takes up most of the back alley, and then there's room for usually one car to park. So that takes up that whole piece. And in a commercial building, most commercial buildings that have back alleys are, don't have the full floor in you know, parking. Like if you go down Waters Lane, for example, you have your store, all your parking's out there. So you can't really take anything away from that parking and say, oh, well, you're having commercial space. <clears throat> Not necessarily that, and that's a totally Longer's different. Lane. Yeah, but Loggers Lane isn't a lane; it's a road. They they could have frontage on that road. It's a truck route, but they could have frontage on that road. It's not it's not a lane per se. It's called Loggers Lane. That's so no contemplation of any kind of reduction. Anything. Yeah. Uh, at this point, there's at this point our policy is no parking in the laneway unless you're on your private property. Yes. yes. Um, it's just not white enough. But we're trying to encourage people to get kind of connected with the back alleys, is that what we're We want to make sure in our designs, we're, we're making sure we have pass-throughs, we're making spaces that are going to be functional pieces of the urban landscape, and not just sort of 
lost or forgotten areas. I think that's what people want to be interested in. Well, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, and it's, it's a sense that we're trying to get out to the developer. Yeah, Doug. Yeah, I, mean, I think there are two different goals here. And when you're dealing with commercial property, um, the goal is, I think, is mostly service, servicing that property. And so it's access, it's deliveries, etc. It's access to parking garages and things like that. Uh, and I take the point that it should be paved, um, but it could also have speed bumps, for example, um, or other traffic calming to prevent it being just a kind of a runway. Um, the residential ones, in my mind, are a little bit different um, because I think, for me, the goal is just local traffic only. And, and so if we're encouraging densification of carriage houses and so forth, I think the zoning requires there to be sufficient off-street parking for the house and for any secondary suites, carriage house or whatever. Um, so you would want access off the alley uh, because you don't want necessarily people parking in the front street if you have another family living in the coach house. So ideally there would be space uh, off the laneway, either underneath or beside or whatever uh, for parking. Um, so it would be needed for vehicle access, but local access only. And I think we don't have to pay them. Uh, people with road bikes can ride in the street. All the kids ride mountain bikes, they're fine on the gravel. You know, there's all kinds of things you can in a back alley. If it is just local traffic, and speed control, uh, I remember the speed limit in Vancouver when I was going up was 15 miles an hour, which is give or take 20k. And so it uh, you can get a safer, certainly safer environment and just discourage the through, the through traffic. Yeah, and some of them don't go through. They're dead. They might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I'm sorry, just in, and Ted's right, I mean, there's not that many around, but we might consider in some future subdivisions the advantages of laneways uh, and put that in front of us. It's pretty hard to retrofit, um, but if we're talking about new developments, we might consider things like that. Uh, well, that and the attractiveness good. of those types of things and whether they be paid or not. Or not. And I believe they did come up as part of the Chikai uh, development, that they, they're part of that. Um, but I think that's, I'm hearing general nods that... The only other one I know of is, uh, is the university area. Has, you know, is, you know, the first developed part of it. I don't know about the recent development. Yeah. But, uh, but there were laneways in there. And um, I'm just thinking maybe we want to have some language around new developments and laneways. Yeah, so if we, if we want, we, we sort of have a couple of options. If there's a rezoning, then we can ask for, we can negotiate improvements to both the road and the lane. The other alternative is if during the, the DDP or building permit or the subdivision, those need to be in the subdivision permit control, I was alternate lane standard. Um, so that would be the place for if there were new standards for these two to resign. We may, I mean, we're sort of two-thirds of the way through the subdivision development control by the review right now. We can certainly look to see if there's something easy to sort of rob and do okay, or borrow from, from somebody else. I don't, if there's something we can borrow, it's probably relatively straightforward. If there's something we want to make up, then it's, it's going to take a little while to do that. Yeah. But I think what I'm hearing is we're sort of almost looking Two standards: one that is more commercially oriented, um, larger scale; one that is very sort of intimate, residential, yep. local, local yep. traffic only uh, vernacular. Okay. And I know that we did DCCs when, well, we did pay DCCs building the laneway houses, or uh, I know that we're not paying DCCs now, but when the development in front of us <coughs> has DCCs, and if the pedestrian part of that DCC sidewalks can maybe go into the education of laneways or something. I just don't think it needs to be overthought. I think it has to be conscious while we're developing that we make sure that those spaces are protected as industrial space. So, um, and then, you know, if we stop thinking about and remove from our future bylaw all sidewalks down the front there, which is actually prime parking space, we could have a covered culvert and make more parking in the front where the parking should be on the roads. 
and then uh, just as Doug says, localized traffic in the back for laneways, and then it will naturally be pedestrian space. We don't have to. I don't think we have to regulate it to death, but I, uh, but I don't think paving it is necessary either. But you know, if we do things like acknowledge that we remove from our budget putting sidewalks, I know Fifth Avenue, Fourth Avenue, all those streets are all in our active transportation plan as places that we're putting sidewalks in the front. And now that it's there's cars everywhere, it's almost impossible to get that done. So if we took the money that we may have assigned to those projects and maybe used it to develop bylaws or made pedestrian spaces in the back instead, just saves, I think it saves a ton of money. People cannot do sidewalks on the streets. People will still access their property through the front. So. Wait, that, that's not the perspective of the conversation. Uh, Peter and Jason, anything to add at this point? No. Um, was that helpful, or we just have never had a conversation with Lanley? So. I will see what if there's something we can easily appropriate. Great, thank you. Um, everyone's okay with that? We'll move on to uh, C10 zoning south of downtown. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's it's dealing with a whole area, so probably not. It's a general discussion. It's a general discussion. Um, I think this came up because we've had a couple applications down there. One hit a roadblock right off the beginning because it just wasn't fitting in with the fluctuousness of the keeping it weird zone. And I guess that's the challenge of having zoning bylaws is there's no keeping it weird zoning that I've seen. Um, I think C C10 attempts to do that, but really, so, Jonas, do you want to add to this? Sure. So we do, um, we do have uh, that, just talking about that one specific zoning that was in front of council a few months ago. There is a second application now, and what we're doing is we're using that application to generate a zone that would potentially form the foundation for replacing the C10 or coming up with a zone that is in line with the vision for downtown south generally. Um, and so we are in the process of drafting a zone. Uh, there's been one um, open house uh, related to that specific application, kind of a visioning open house with the community. Um, we've taken some comments back. We're using some of the things we learned from the MUD-1 um, rezoning and uh, crafting essentially a MUD-2 zone that is in line with the downtown neighborhood plan vision. Um, and we're going to be going back out to the community uh, to solicit more feedback before that uh, application comes back to council. But that could be a good um, experiment to come up with a zone that works for, for downtown south. And it's sort of, it would be uh, trying to enhance and build on what's already happening down there, which is creative, artisan, and light industrial uses mixed in with residential and maybe some office space. Do you remember what the genesis of this? Was it, do you remember? Okay. The zoning? No, this, the, the item here. It yeah. came out of a meeting. So yeah, I asked you to put it on the agenda. Yeah, <laughs> I just couldn't remember. <laughs> no, and, and, uh, and thank you for doing that. So um, it was, when I sat, at, we all remember that rezoning application. Um, and, and if I recall, it was a 6-1 vote and I was the one. As I looked around and listened to the reasons uh, of the other six, um, there did not seem to me to be any consensus. So I had a vision uh, for what I thought that zone might, might stand for or might, might accept. Um, obviously, wasn't shared that night, but, uh, but, I, but I was concerned that, you know, just for the development community, for planning staff and stuff, it really didn't seem to be, because I heard different reasons for opposing it. It wasn't everybody all on one page. So, so that's where I was thinking. So for me, um, after listening to the owners, I mean, I, I went into the meeting of the zoning thinking it was a bit of a transition between uh, kind of the commercial uh, and 
some residential area of the Cleveland Second Avenue to getting to the pretty well entirely residential area of Fourth and Fifth Avenue and things like that. Um, and so what I heard that night was um, a reluctance to have townhouses, for example, in there. Um, there was some commercial, uh, maybe not enough commercial. Um, so I didn't know if we wanted to try to set some parameters. So for example, on, on housing forms, or residential forms, uh, are we, or would we ever consider something with townhouses in it, or is it strictly apartments uh, kind of above commercial? Uh, or in there right now, I think there's probably even some single family. Uh, you know, so are we trying to steer that in any particular direction, or are there some things that are not acceptable? And as far as commercial goes, is there, is there some guidance we can give the development community? Is there some ratio of the percentage of the property in the local area, for example, that you might, might want to see as commercial or light industrial or something like that. So, so that's kind of the concern I had. And, and, and after that particular meeting, the developer phoned me up and sort of said, where do I go? And I had no answer for that. I mean, I just honestly had no idea. And so I thought as a, as a sort of as a council, we should have perhaps just maybe a slightly tighter vision. I, I get the eclectic part, though, and after listening to Jonas, maybe I'm not correct thinking of it as a transition between commercial to residential. Maybe it's an animal all by itself. <coughs> it's not a transition from anything to anywhere. Uh, and even so, if that's the case, then what is it? Because eclectic, I don't think, uh, it's a long time since I read it, but eclectic, I don't think, is in there, and funky isn't in there, but words like artisan are in there, and what does that mean? So, not everything that happens down there is related to art uh, or crafts, um, so, but it seems to be acceptable. So, anyway, so that's, that's where I was coming from. Yeah, I've got Ted and Susan on the list, but I'm going to quickly chime in. Um, I, I actually heard more consensus on the people who <laughs> rejected yeah, that application was in front of us, uh, and a lot of it had to do with the, 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 the type of housing, the townhome, uh, the type of uh, commercial fairly generic commercial, and the treatment of the alleyway, which we've had a conversation with just previously. So, I mean, those are the three things that I heard come up, and it just didn't fit. And it's tough when we have these cookie cutter zones that say, you put this here, and you can have this use here, and you put this here. And really, this whole area was developed in the absence of, uh, probably had zones, but it, it got developed uh, randomly and haphazardly. So, we don't have a zone that would articulate what's happening down there. And it's really hard for us to figure out how do we get it funky, in, like in that area, to a piece of paper that tells you what you can and cannot do down there. So um, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to articulate, absolutely. I think, we need to, I think we need to think outside of the typical zoning box to get there, because our typical zoning box will give us very Generic things that won't fit in with that neighborhood at all. Tendency. Yeah, thanks. Um, the condos I know are not something that the neighborhoods down there. I mean, we're talking about basically city block by district <coughs> blocks. And there is a large chunk of those out there that, you know, I think it's really important to keep our eye on. That's it used to be Cap Universities. I'm not sure if it's sold. Right at the south end of town. It's completely waterfront all the way around. A beautiful piece of property. And most developers would look at that and go, How many townhomes can I get on that? that, that I can probably get 60 townhomes on there. I'll take 150,000 up per townhome. So that's the kind of thinking that some development has that goes into that. And, you know, I know myself from building some of the buildings down there. I never looked just looked at the building. And so I would think at the, at the part nine building doesn't give you many options for 20 apartments. Part nine, you can only have one apartment. And maybe one with a suite. So you look at Peter Legere's buildings, I mean, he put a he put a big building in there on a bigger piece of property and he's got lots of land sitting around his building and he's got a youth fossil kind of thing. Most of the owners down there that have the little residences that you're talking about do 
dream one day of building a building where they're going to move into. One day I'm going to tear down my house, which they are going to, the houses will come down. And they dream of tearing them down and building maybe two or three apartments and living in one and renting out a couple and having their business downstairs. So when we open up the zoning to, you know, like in our zoning it talks about mixed use, a mixture of uses. So you can have a mixture of uses. So you can have a house. Industry, or you can have a like the one you're talking about, and so development goes for the money. And I know that if you don't allow those big bucks to be made by multi-family, then chances are you'll get a collective. And, and the majority of the property owners just want to build their own little thing down there. They're not looking for that multi. <coughs> so the multi when the multi units start coming. buffer zone to residential, which usually that's what it is, but there's no residential, there's no buffer zone. And it's buffering so the St. Ward, and it's buffering everything north of Vancouver Street, which is a high density. It's what you're putting in from all the multis. I'm going to sue them and maybe you always want to talk about it. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would agree with Ted is having these lots that are worth so much money now, and that people that own them, as they get sold off, it is going to be multi-multi, and you lose the ability to live where it can. The artesian zoning is always in front of them. The artesian bread. <laughs> the, artesian the, artisan, the artisan zoning. I remember when I first uh, dealt with the council trying to find a place to work, and the artisan zoning didn't include professional offices. And there's a ton of professional offices down there in the artisan zone. And once in a while, we'll get a little application for a professional office to convert, or because they don't have business licenses. And because it was industrial and then artisan, and it still leaves out all the people that actually work down there. So um, I'd like to see the zoning opened up down there to allow what, you know, like maybe that's a place where we try out not having specific zoning, but we have requirements instead of zoning. Like we have a different way of looking at that area and say, you know what, let's not prescribe this area and let's let people work and live together in the same place and not prescribe and say, you can, you can do this job and you can't use computers on the second floor and you can, you know, like it, it be, it's become so prescriptive that it is going to be just investment and it's not going to actually allow that place to become the neighborhood that it wants to be with the owners that are currently there. And I, I think it'd be interesting to try out something new, not like the mud zone, but like a zone that actually doesn't have a zone and allows artists and uh, industry and people to work together in a way that they see that they control by the neighborhood and be less regulated, not more. Yeah, and further to that, but I think it, it could we could use the template that we use for the mud zone up north mm -hmm. and make an adaptation of that and, and craft something new around that concept. So maybe, uh, Yannis, reflect on the idea of making this almost like a bit of a pilot project. Um, how, how that would or wouldn't look. Well, you didn't want to suggest it, so. I hypothesis. <laughs> like, um, I think we would want to ensure that there's at least you know, maybe not the limitation on uses, but employment versus residential use, um, and leave it at that. It has some challenges because you know, the if you list the uses that are allowed, that gives some certainty to the neighbors that there's not going to be a nightclub uh, or a grow up or something like that open up next door. So there's already a grow up. There's a grow up, and there's probably a nightclub. <laughs> yes, but the downtown in general is probably you know there are some uses that are. That are, uh, don't work well with residential, um, and I think maybe leaving the door wide open, but listing a few things that are not okay, um, could work. But I, I think that is an interesting idea to experiment, yeah. and I think that's what the community down there be also interested in. Go ahead. So would we would we be prescriptive at all about housing forms, um, or? 
support. I mean, for example, if somebody came along with a townhouse, uh, and part of the development was also some uh, some artisan uses, some craft, or some light manufacturing, uh, we just reject it because it's got a townhouse in it, uh, or how flexible might we be? Um, and I don't want to put you in the spot. I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question. You know, but how if we start thinking about so much residential versus commercial to encourage employment uh, as well as people living there. I agree with you. I mean, if you're going to mix the two uses, they've got to be compatible uh, at some levels. Uh, otherwise, people won't want to live there and fail as a residential area. But, but now, how prescriptive are we going to be about the type of residential? Is it always just going to be apartments above some kind of space? One thing that we could do, uh, and that was the, the proposal we had, was to tie, similar to mud one zone, is to tie the residential to employment space, so that it's a percentage, your residential component is a percentage of the employment space, which uh, would probably eliminate uh, larger um, residential components, because you, if, you, if you have to be at least 50-50 residential and employment space then uh, uh, the developers will normally try and maximize the number of units. Um, so create them, they'll, they'll likely create more smaller units of residential space. Jason? Yeah, I think uh, we should go in the direction of uh, <coughs> uh, taking residential uses right out of the zoning. And I think it should just be employment land. And then I think we should have a uh, development variance slash rezoning policy that states that we will consider uh, residential uses provided they are compatible with uh, the employment uses that are already present or proposed and you know limit it to uh, rental okay we won't consider any strata or um, ownership type models and, um, and I think you'd probably still get exactly same type of development that is already there. Um, as far as I understand, with the exception of the single family homes, the, the, I think almost all the residential is rental. I don't think there are very many strata where it's all owner occupied. Um, could be wrong, but they're not purpose built rental. They're somebody owns it and set up somebody. Yeah, yeah, but it's got you know like little micro units and stuff like that. So um, I think that's the only way to clearly send a signal really want that because if you leave the door open um, to you know residential then you're still going to attract the type of development that is um, you know looking for uh, you know selling condos you know whether they have multiple floors or a single floor is going to be selling condos and I think that 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 right on its own will that changes the character of the neighborhood already because you're going to have probably more conflict around different types of uses. You'll have affordability issues and, and things like that. And one of the things that I would call them out when we, when we discussed uh, that one proposal was that existing residents, they like the fact that, you know, they were okay with the fact that there is an artisan doing metal working, right? And the noise, and they accept that. So I think we should kind of, you know, it's more like buyer beware um, or renter beware or whatever, but you know, have something I'd be more in favor of being a little bit more uh, prescriptive because if we're not prescriptive, then the end is always residential. So, so just building on what Jason just said, I'm um, just copying some time. We don't have too much more time for this. If we if we did it more on a, it's basically employment lands. Um, uh, con consideration of residential on a rezoning application basis. So there's some discretion with that. What would that like? Could we do something like that? Yeah, we just zone it employment space and maybe an accessory residential unit. Um, but I'm not sure whether the community, like the downtown neighborhood plan, that's not what it envisioned. There definitely was a residential component envisioned, and I think it's important to check in with with the community down there because it is quite an engaged group of uh, residents. To make sure that it, that is on the right track, um, 
Is it is it worth doing a bit of? I know this is work and it's not the work plan, but is it worth doing a bit of a charrette with the local residents down there to sort of come up with a bit of a concept and template? Yeah, and that's what we plan to do. Okay, so that's that's in the works. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, we have an excellent advisory design panel made up of super smart architects and designers and landscape architects and all those people there. And they would be a huge resource for that there. Um, I think that if you make anything prescriptive, it makes it, it kicks away. You know, and I know there's <coughs> one person looking at developing down there and they do really creative architecture and creative uses. Hearing some of the comments, I thought, well, that won't fit. Oh, if we do that, that won't fit. So I think putting a lot of wording in for creative and not too many rules might help the area more than saying <coughs> you know, prescriptive. You know, you say, they start saying rentals, but all these people that own the properties down there dream someday of building a building that they're going to live in. So that's not rental. You know what I mean? So not particularly. Okay, so the next step is uh, you can have a community meeting. I, I'm, all, I'm always in favor of uh, getting some feedback from the ADP and just using that brain trust to bounce ideas and things off. So um, you can do that as well, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. We would go to the community first, uh, get their input, um, then adjust the zone that we've been working on, um, and then we would bring it to ADP before we come back to council. Okay, everyone good? Yep. Thank you very much. Um, uh, development procedure bylaw for discussion. Um, actually, this came up a couple times, but uh, in particular, we wanted to um, have council reflect on the need to have uh, 10 people comment within 20 days on the website asking for a public meeting or not. We had one just a couple weeks ago that I think there was seven people. I thought if seven people take the time to make a comment thing on the website, then there's probably more than seven people that are interested in the issue. I think uh, my BOSA's project down in the C10 zone would have really benefited from a community meeting beforehand too. So I wanted council, I, we only brought this in maybe five or six, seven, it was your first year or your second year? Anyway, um, this idea of, it used to be every development had a public meeting. Um, we don't get a lot of people coming to public meetings. And the, when I say public meetings, it's not a public hearing. This is a developer uh, hosted, here's my development proposal, um, introduction of their development proposal to the neighborhood. It used to be, everyone did it, no matter what. Um, I think the developers complained that people weren't showing up. We should only hope that people are gonna show up. And so we, we put this threshold of 10 people commenting. I think it's kind of, um, Hurt some developments, ironically, uh, and also um, anyway, I'd like to open that up to council to see if maybe it's a lower threshold, or maybe we leave it, you know, in staff's discretion to say, yeah, you really need to go to public hearing this will help your project, um, and sort of guide them in that direction instead of just having this benchmark that they have to Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a couple things. Another rationale for it, which I'm sure council can appreciate, is that we always send a plan for those meetings to hear from the public and, and the developer, and that's pretty onerous as well for meetings for people on the show. We did discuss it, Gary, Jonas, and I, and one idea we have is setting a threshold based on number of units, um, so that might be something that council wants to consider, uh, so that the smaller ones where there might not be interest, or to your point, council, uh, staff discretion in terms of, you know, this would likely generate interest even more. What we discussed was rather than sort of saying, well, let's go for 10 or 7, okay, so six people apply, um, is that um, look at a sort of a cumulative threshold if it's we get that number of people, 10, or if it has more than X units or more than X Y growth for area, if it meets any one of those three, you have public information needed. So rather than sort of adjusting the numbers, <coughs> sort of layering that and providing different threshold, any of which you need, um, 
So even if it's like seven people on a relatively big project, I think there's a bunch of... <coughs> yeah, I agree with that approach. I think that uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, but the other thing I would add is, uh, is leave a, a bullet for staff discretion if there's some potentially controversial point, um, whatever it might be. Sometimes a duplex can be controversial for some reason. So, uh, so I would just give yourself an extra bullet to, uh, to have the ability to compel a developer uh, if there was some kind of a significant change of use or something that might not have aroused public attention yet, but, uh, but it's in the staff's view of um, what merits meeting. And I think a good example of that is the one that happened in the C10 zoning. It might not, you know, if we set a 15 unit threshold or something, it might not have tipped that, but looking at the context of the neighborhood and the interest level, um, I don't think anyone actually went to the website and requested a public meeting on that one. Maybe there might have been one or two, but we had 30 people in the audience that day. So we have to be, have sort of a spidey sense on about those things. Um, any other thoughts on that? Everyone's okay with that? <coughs> Anything else in the procedural bylaw? Well, 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 you not the procedural bylaw, but the development procedures bylaw. Yeah, and, and I don't know, frankly, if it's in the bylaw or not, but, but the thing that, um, has concerned me a couple of times is um, on a particular rezoning is delegation showing up uh, at first meeting, first reading, or second reading, or even at the committee of the whole meeting, um, and the whole thing turning into almost a public hearing, except nobody's really prepared for a public hearing. Um, and sometimes the person that's, that's kind of caught off guard by that is the actual proponent who expected just a discussion with counselors and staff, uh, and then is facing um, a whole wave of the public who just saw the agenda and showed up. So I wonder if we want to, it's kind of a, I, I guess I'm putting it back in your hands because it's sort of the mayor's prerogative with dealing with, or the chair's prerogative dealing with delegations uh, or not, and uh, whether we want to consider uh, some restrictions on that, where it is a zoning process and there's going to be a public hearing and there's there's a structure around zoning process, as we all know, it's pretty legislative. Uh, whether we want to kind of open it up, and, and if we do, um, then I think we have to open it up to everybody, uh, clearly, and we want to get both sides of any debate that might be there. Which kind of just sort of takes away all the structure and it becomes a bit of a free-for-all, so that's, that's the concern I have. Okay. Um, I think that we should just let our developers know that we have open and transparent government on our list of priorities. And if you come to the first meeting and there's 30 people in the audience, we're going to let them speak. So be prepared. Like, I, I actually think it's healthy because I, I think there's a lot of cynicism of not getting that community feedback until public hearing because people feel that, that the deal is kind of done by them, but they don't actually have a lot of impact speaking at a public hearing. Like, I actually think we've heard a lot of that cynicism for some of the people at the Chief Five Man who said, I don't even want to get up and speak. I feel like this is kind of, you know, what's the point of all the people that are here speaking for it? So I actually like it at first reading or at committee level when we allow the community to speak and express an opinion there. And I think our developers should just be ready to be on the ball and answer questions. This is our community. If you want to develop here, we're going to let people ask you questions in the public meeting. I, I don't have a problem with it. I think helps us get really good feedback before public hearing as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've kind of got two views on that now, but I, I do think that if we're going to open something up to the floor on first reading like that, and we say to the developer, well, you better be prepared because there might be 30 people there, and we better be prepared for an hour slot for that particular. So, so a lot of times when we have first reading, well, you've got 15 minutes, so give us your bits. Since when? <laughs> 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 Come on, everybody has a timeline. You've, uh, you've been paying attention for the last two and a half years. Uh, We're yeah, pretty I, lenient I, on the same timeline. I've been sitting here for five years, and I've watched developments come through there for 10 minutes. We just do a development. That's it. Sorry, buddy. That's it. You're cut off. 10 people will travel up from Vancouver and sit there, and we give them 10 minutes. So I'm just saying, if we're going to have, if we're going to say to the 
crowd, come on in, you've got your chance to speak, say to the developer, bring your crew, because we're going to need all your resources there to answer these questions and prepare the time that we can do it. Otherwise, let's follow the process. Susan, thanks. thanks. I uh, spoke to the mayor on the plane about this because he said that his about the difficulty with not with waiting until the basically the deal's done after second reading and uh, and having a public, public meeting there where we've already discussed what we want to see and we haven't really included the public. So I would agree with Karen that it really does make for open process when you have a time where the developer presents their idea and gets a lot of feedback from the public. I think it's a good time to have that time for the public to speak and he made it a part of policy where at first reading where they came in he would just let all the public come in and say what they wanted it was a separate it wasn't really a formal public meeting but the developer knew that when they came in for first reading they were going to get whatever the public had to say was allowed to be said and I like that a lot I really thought it was a worthwhile thing to adopt uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have necessarily a problem with uh, doing the first reading, um, I think, uh, and having the public there, because I actually think in most cases the developer would be better well served having that information earlier rather than later. Um, so my only question would be is, uh, we do have very specific requirements for notice for the public hearing, and would we entertain something like that as well for the first reading, so that We do have to have a distinction between the legislative public process. It, it's very strict. Um, if we start to create a bunch of those processes, it's going to really bog us down in terms of so making sure we're crossing all our T's and dotting all, all the time. It's going to be really cumbersome. I think this council has been really good about changing up how we go about doing first readings. It used to be that first and second reading came at once. Second reading would happen to go to public hearing, and that was the process. There was very little input. We've been moving away from that and doing a lot more just first reading. Sometimes we do second reading if it's not an overly complicated uh, rezoning or OCP application. Usually OCPs are more complicated. Um, and we've always been open for the developer to come and speak to first reading, because they often have issues that they want to speak to at first reading or a way of presenting. So it's always been open to the developer to come and speak at first reading and therefore should be open to the public. I do like, and we've been doing that, we've been trying to do that, make sure those big development applications come into committee where we try to really open the floor up to, to the community. Uh, we don't necessarily advertise it like we do a public hearing, you know, two weeks in advance and then two different publications or whatever the rules are. Um, and maybe we could figure out a better way of showcasing the developments that are coming up on our agendas a little bit better through the website, through social media, through a variety of things, just so we can get the word out a little bit more. But I really think it's valuable. I think most everyone's spoken to it. Making sure the public feels like they're involved early on in the process. Make sure council feels like they're involved early on so we don't sort of get all the way down an avenue um, and, and actually make it a lot better for the developer in the end too because they'll be hearing and hopefully delivering more community council is looking for. Yeah, so I'm just thinking about consistency because for the chair is chair of community development um, and when the mayor's asking can we hold each other as I'm not. So um, to Doug's point, it might be great to, to at least have some guidance. So maybe we do actually limit the number of times people can speak for, because we don't want, I actually don't want to be in community hold for like five hours. Uh, it's certainly up to the chair and the it committee's to discretion. The chair. Yeah. But in order to maybe just tame it a little bit, it would be, you know, if there's a big crowd, you might, as chair, so not make it a policy, but just a guideline. Mm -hmm. um, here are things you can do, limit the number of times you can speak, you know, 
um, or keep, ask them to keep their comments to five minutes or less, that kind of thing. Um, or ask them to appoint a, a, a spokesperson. A spokesperson. And when the Air Bubble Springs group came forward, the people from Sky Ridge, they sort of had some of their speaking on behalf, which was really helpful. Um, but the other thing I was thinking of is we publish things on the development showcase. And I think that would be a good place to say first reading is this date. And, and, and first reading is, can be an opportunity for both the developer and the public to provide feedback. So, so it becomes connected to the showcase without having to spend money on noticing and thinking <coughs> structure of the thing. Um, I just would like to put just a little bit of process around how we actually deal with these so it's fair to everybody. And I think the key thing would be to alert the developer uh, because I don't think all of them quite expect it because it may not happen in other jurisdictions, for example. Um, so uh, is to alert the developer uh, and make it a point of first reading is to have a developer presentation as part of, because usually, very often, it's just our staff. That introduces the bylaw and give the developer an opportunity to speak. The advantage of it, um, that people have pointed out, is that and we, and the reason we separate first and second reading is so we can make changes after first reading before second reading. And this would be one of the things that we would respond to uh, would be that public input uh, and also the developer, because I agree with Jason. Uh, it's a lot nicer for a developer to make it early in the stage rather than try and pick up the pieces after third reading and go out or something like that. So. So um, if we can do that, if we can encourage uh, spokespeople, uh, I don't want to buy ours to me at the whole meeting either, uh, or first reading even. Um, first reading is usually not that kind of a deal. So, so I think it's just a matter of putting a little bit of process around that, uh, encouraging spokespeople, uh, chairing a meeting, encouraging just the same, not the same point from 20 different people. It's not an election. Uh, it's not a vote. It's just we just need the point, and if somebody else has made it, we don't have to talk. And so, um, and then also give the developer, uh, who very often does have consultants here uh, that they're paying for, uh, an opportunity to answer some of these questions. Because there are occasions where people are objecting to something, and the guy that's got the answer is sitting in the audience and doesn't get a chance to speak, and, and may kind of put that little fire out right there. And so, uh, so I think it's important to give them a chance to respond to some of these. Stuff. Well, you say, yeah, we can change that. That's a good, a good idea. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Doug, more than adequately, that's the nail on the head for me. So, uh, it sounds like you may want to add a little bit of warning to the development procedures bylaw as well as uh, the procedural bylaw. And I I don't want to get overly prescriptive, and I'm looking maybe at Robin to help us formulate some language around chairing of committee meetings uh, with regard, and maybe it's in the development. Anyway, we'll find a home for, to make sure um, a developer, when anyone pick up, picks up a bylaws, can read it and go, okay, there, there's public process throughout, but we will try to manage it. Yeah, and um, maybe Jonas and I can draft that as opposed to having council prescribe it right now. Yeah, that's what I'm that saying. Something yeah. for sure. Um, I think that it will be important too for whoever is chairing the meeting where the, the go no go happens or first reading that um, you know that there's maybe a, a, a blurby that says this is not a public hearing that the official public hearing that, that we because we don't Keep want to be challenged down the road that oh I thought that was a public hearing okay. we, we don't want that legislative process challenged so okay, that'd be we'll great. write that right in and onto the applications and everything. Thanks, Mayor Hunt. So I just want clarification. So the two major points. The first is the um, requirement for public information. Mm -hmm. Includes staff discretion. And then the second is around enabling public engagement at the first and second reading, in it, like outside of public hearing. Yeah, and, and um, um, making it clear to both the community and to the developer that input will be open at first reading as well as at committee. Um, the process is open. So the developers understand that this is part of how we try to make sure our community is considered and 
what we're deliberating, as well as the community understands that we're listening throughout the process. We want to hear, hear from them in a constructive manner. But we do have to put some guidance for chairs in particular to be able to ensure that we're being effective with their time. That's unfair. Is that, is that fair enough, Robin? Yes. Yeah. Still have to okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, number four: locating light industrial uses away from residential areas. Uh, staff update. So what it says on here. <laughs> 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 I think this stems from the discussion of the um, uh, uh, the grow up facility on Third Avenue. Yes, it does. And so we we, we do have it on a list of uh, things to look at uh, when we do the zoning bylaw update. Um, whether that type of use is uh, fits well with the downtown or with any really uh, higher density residential areas. And in, when we were contemplating the zone in which uh, medical marijuana cooperations could be located, originally we said we weren't going to be downtown. And I can't remember how, why we rationalized that they could be in, in industrial zones downtown. I can't remember that conversation off the top of my head. Um, but um, having now a neighborhood sort of going through the experience of living beside a, a fairly large um, Grow up, uh, legitimized, commercial, legitimized. Um, it may be something we want to reflect on a little bit more. They, they may not be so compatible. I got Ted in there. Yeah, I, I think it, one of the reasons why there was one that was running there because the first bylaw that came out for medical marijuana was light industrial, and so nobody really fine tuned it to say light industrial except in the downtown. Oh no, we well we had talked about it before this one was in. That one was in there and it had like 30 jobs, so who's going to kick it out? No, I don't think it was up and running when we first contemplated Anyway, so, but the question is on the one there on third is uh, I mean, the property certainly could have a higher value, better use some days because it's you know, maybe in a bit sitting on a holding pond, which is almost like waterfront. Whatever we do, you know, we couldn't take the just cancel their business license and say you're no longer here, right? They, yeah, they're currently permitted to be there. Can they get unpermitted? Uh, they would have to suspend their operations for six months or more in order for them to lose the, the legal yeah. from yeah. right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, and I don't think it's necessary about shutting something down at this point. It's about making sure that we do whatever we can to make it nice for the neighborhood. And make sure we're in the future, any future ones, we're considering what we've learned. Doesn't Yeah, thank you. It was uh, it was last term that this discussion happened. Uh, I think it predates any, and, and it was just a new animal. And none of us, of course, have had experience with anything like this. Um, and we did initially restrict it um, to light industrial, and not in the downtown area. I went away for a holiday and came back and it somehow got changed from the meeting that I missed. Uh, That's and what I say, it's because of the jobs. Well, I don't know what, no, I don't think it was there yet. So anyway, in any event, my, my concern, I'm not talking about this particular business because it's, I think it's grandfathered unless they decide to just go away. Um, I'm <coughs> thinking about the next one. And to me, it's not just grow ups. It's, we had the discussion a few minutes ago about the C10 zone and what might be workable when you have residential and industrial and commercial mixing. Uh, so I think it's a bit of a broader discussion. Um, and, and there's obvious things, noise and smoke and just different things that would make it inconsistent with, um, with the residential neighborhood. And, and I think those are sort of the complaints that are coming out of, or we're coming out of this particular operation. So I think it's broader than the ops. I think, I think it's a very legitimate question. It's, it applies to the C10 zone and probably some other zones around. Uh, what is the mix between industrial and residential, what are the uses um, in the mud zone or, I think the word mud, is there another acronym? <laughs> 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 the 
just doesn't sound very nice at all, and I think we're trying to make it something nice. But anyway, so in the mud zone, uh, there's going to be residential and light industrial in fairly close quarters, and so I think ideally they'll be compatible uses. Um, so, so I think it's a bit of a broader thing, uh, but I would certainly like staff to have a look at that, and maybe there is some revision um, in certain areas, maybe not across the board, but maybe some areas more than others. Thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking that it's not so much about the uses, but just making sure we've got buffers and if it's something that produces smell, if they, their smell can't be their boundary. And if it's noise, the noise can't be above a certain level. So I think if there's other, rather than it being about uses, which we can't anticipate, it's more about you can't disturb your neighbors, whether that's light, noise, smell, and then we've got to be conscious. I think what we're doing on the northern part of the business park with the mud zone is, um, and the forest buffer is just making sure we keep those buffers and maintain them. Um, you know, Paco Road, not that that's got its zoning in place, is making sure that we're careful with what's allowed there so it's not disturbing the same. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add to that before I go to the student here, um, when Carney's had their compost facility in the uh, industrial park, business park, they couldn't keep their zoning requirements for smell and that type of thing and, and had to move. And had to put to Whistler. But I mean, that would similarly be the case. Um, so I think it's a matter of figuring out the parameters around these uses, particularly in within zoned or integrated zones, residential. And, uh, and, and others would be targeted. A daycare may not um, go very well next to something that smells a lot like marijuana. How about a citizen? Yeah, and I think we have to be careful with saying light industrial away from residential in general. Just that language is, we just talked about a zone, the C10 zone, that's got light industrial everywhere and right next to residential. And now we're talking about opening that up. And I, again, agree with Councillor Elliott, we have to mandate the good neighbor bylaw and ensure that that good neighbor bylaw actually has some teeth to it uh, that has policy in it and not just recommendations. So as we bring that forward, that talks about smell and light pollution and noise, those are the things that make things unpleasant. It's not the use. So that uh, and everything else has been said. Thank you. Yeah. And it has been said, but I agree with the ancillary spillovers of whatever those industries are. The that's not right. Yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily about light industrial, but about making sure we're good neighbors. Uh, is that? enough guidance for? Um, yes, I mean that's a general thing to keep in mind I think as we look with the mud zoning um, we looked at uh, specific light industrial uses that have a higher or a lesser chance to cause a friction between employment and residential spaces but I think the general trend um, across the board is, is to integrate residential with other types of uses and maybe just some people are not quite used to that, and it's all you know. Everybody has a different level of um, acceptance when it comes to noise and uh, and sound. Like a daycare can be a very noisy um, thing, uh, but it fits well in the residential setting. Um, so I, we, we're always cautious of, of um, in the rezoning process to make sure that the uses that are going in are appropriate. Children um, uh, giggling in a play yard, grandma's like like. Scratching your nails on a chalkboard. Yes. I'm kidding. <laughs> I live next to a daycare, and you know, there's a few people in our complex that complain all the time really? about the sound. Um, I've got kids, so I'm kind of exposed to that all the time. <laughs> but it, everybody has a different time. tolerance level. No, I, I, was, I was kidding. <laughs> everybody. Um, that's your story you're sticking to. Yes, I know. <laughs> that's the story that's going to appear on the paper. <laughs> Children too, scratching on that chalkboard. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. But yes, when we when we do the review of the zoning bylaw, we will look at broader a set of uses, probably more specific to to uh, more heavy industrial uses in the light industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think there is a danger in sort of just categorizing everything in light industrial as not compatible, and really, I think you know, so just. The language around using it, just light industrial. I, I see Susan's point about making sure we're 
we've got the other mechanisms to make sure that some of those uses are compatible with residential and vice versa. Yes. Okay, everyone's good. Excellent. And finally, contaminated brownfield site redevelopment. Um, I think we've been talking about sort of having a conversation about putting some policy around um, how we encourage brownfield development. Uh, particularly all the old gas stations in the downtown, um, among other places. Um, and do we want to create some language around what our expectations are when there's an abandoned site? How do we encourage the redevelopment of it? Um, do we take a proactive role in helping with funding that we may have access to to help redevelop some of these sites? I just want to open the floor up to um, how we may start to I'm hoping that, uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly if there's anything in the OCP about this, but it may actually be something we want to have it within the OCP. Uh, and Susan, the Ted. It's, um, it concerned me more a few years back uh, having a brownfield site still up, but we had the oceanfront brownfield site, and we, like, there was a lot of brownfield site. As our, as, as our real estate prices skyrocket, redevelopment is, less of a concern, um, but when those brownfield sites at the beginning of town get left empty and there's no incentive to remediate, uh, it's a problem. And most towns, I know at least out in the east, have a brownfield remediation policy so that you can't leave it for, for years on end because most of them are abandoned gas stations or sites that are expensive to remediate and it's cheaper <coughs> to just not remediate them and not even put them on the market than to deal with it and it's a it's a blip in their real estate uh, portfolio but for us it's not having the means to be able to redevelop an, uh, an expensive downtown site that could be good for housing and, or other uses. Um, when I put the good neighbor bylaw forward in the first place that was one of the big concerns I had was having a policy in the good neighbor bylaw that meant that the uh, empty lots did not stay empty for more than two years at a time, and then after a certain amount of time, you either had to remediate it or put it on the market for remediation. So the, you, you gave you two options to deal with it, and if you weren't going to remediate it yourself, you had to put it on the market for market value of somebody else having the opportunity to remediate it, but leaving it fenced off and brownfield was not an option in the community. So I'd like to see us move towards a policy where brownfield sites aren't left abandoned for years on end as fenced off uh, horrendous sites. We've had talked about make, beautifying them or allowing them to have community gardens on them, which are also great things. And maybe in that two year interim, they can open it up to community gardens. Um, but having a time limit on it, and I don't know in the legislation. And also, Green Municipal Funds and the uh, SBM has a ton of money for brownfield remediation. And maybe that's the money we make available, we, we allow people to know about or give options to property owners and say, look, there's money available, they'll do the study for you, they'll remediate the land for you, and here there's really cheap money available for that. So, thanks. Uh, Tim. Well, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> uh, that's the money that John used on his corner right. there. Especially on the high profile <coughs> sites, you know, like any gas stations on busy corners. I like what Susan said about having a policy that gives them a strict timeline for a gas station to clean up and get the property back into uh, the hands of what it should be used for instead of a fenced yard for 15 years. Strong word. Yeah, thanks. So, first of all, I don't think any of these sites are abandoned. Um, they're all owned by somebody. Uh, they just may not be used as a gas station anymore or whatever the previous use was. Um, the particular site at uh, Pemberton Avenue has been undergoing remediation uh, in one form or another for quite a while. And I'm not an expert in that. But with petroleum and hydrocarbons, Typically, it does take a while. And the other example I can remember is where the CIBC and Tim Hortons is. That was an old card lock, and that was 
they think for holy smokes probably at least a decade and uh, before it was able to be used again. So, um, and I don't know about the district putting money into it because these are typically private businesses and, and there's issues around that, uh, us providing funds for private businesses. I suspect we have a lot of legislative constraints around us forcing a private developer to develop uh, or to sell their property. Uh, I'd be very surprised if we could do any of that. So uh, the market typically takes care of these things. There's a mediation they have to go through. It's provincial standards uh, have to be met, not municipal. Um, and whether we can compel them to do something while they're undergoing this, I don't know. Um, I suspect we're very limited in that. Well, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up because, as far as I know, in some other jurisdictions, you have one year. You shut down the gas station. You have one year to clean up that property. What I know they're doing at the local gas stations that have been removed is if you let a site that has hydrocarbons in the ground sit long enough, the enzymes in the soil eventually do the cleanup. So you don't have to do anything. Gas station, you let it sit for 15 years, and oh look, it's clean. So, and, that, and that's, I know they did one on the corner of Third and Vancouver, the old bulk station down there, and they got pressured by the landowner who was a lease to clean up that property, and they they cleaned it up. They built holding ponds, and they got a circulation line, and they got they pumped into a holding pond that had enzymes in it. In other words, they planted a beautiful garden on the property just circulated water in there, and three years later it was cleaned up. And that was Chevron doing that. And, you know, so, so the way they're cleaning up the sites, the ones that are bothering us, is they're doing the 15-year sit. The property's going up in value, the land's slowly decontaminating by itself, and we're taking the brunt of it in a terrible looking site at the entrance of my town. So, I mean, I, other jurisdictions. So I'd like, I'd like it if we could find some examples of other jurisdictions. Lots. Yeah. So I think the challenge is, um, I know there are a lot in Ontario, for example, but the community charter, whatever they call it, that governs municipalities in Ontario is quite a bit different than the community charter that we have. And uh, BC, I think, has the least autonomous, autonomous um, community charter local government act. Gives the least amount of autonomy to local governments. We're very much governed by the provincial government. So I think maybe what I'm looking for is if there are specific things holding us back from ensuring that they don't just leave a derelict site, that there's some expectation of keeping the site attractive so it doesn't just look like an abandoned site that then makes more people dump and think that they can be negligent in other parts of town too. Like if we can figure out that, and if there's a piece of legislation that doesn't allow us to do that, then we need to lobby the provincial government to maybe through UBSM or some other facility to be able to enact that change or hopefully get that change. Um, there are so many community benefits from brownfield redevelopment. We get barely any taxes off of these empty lots that just sit there. Um, very few of them are proactive about cleaning them up. Most of them are just wait and see and let, you know, 20 years go by before they do anything because it's cheaper to do that than to actually do something. Provincial government, if they actually had standards of cleaning things up, that would be helpful. You can't leave a site. You you pollute the site, you have to clean it up. You don't clean it up, you get fined. You lose your property. I don't know. We need to do something because there's health benefits, social benefits, tax revenue benefits. All these things are, there's a lot of huge beneficial aspects of redeveloping these brownfield sites. Well, we seem to have, we don't have any tools in the district of Squamish to help inspire these brownfield uh, redevelopments and these brownfield cleanups. Um, but I think it, it's a, I would like to see something in the official community plan. I know we're at the draft stage, but I didn't see anything in there. I think at a very base level, um, we should be putting some policy in the OCP about um, how we view brownfield in terms of uh, their opportunity and the expectation of owners that we do it with, with a lot of other different zones, with a lot of different uses. I think brownfield is something we've kind of overlooked for a long time. Uh, Susan and Karen. Yeah. 
sites, maybe that could change and act as an incentive to redevelop. So how would... We set the tax rate for, um, for different zones, as, or for different uh, uses of land, commercial, industrial, residential, and I think there's, there's a difference between the tax, uh, I'm not an expert on taxes, just an idea. Well, let, let's maybe, yeah, I think it's worth exploring to see what tools we have in order to incentivize redevelopment or disincentivize just leaving uh, uh, brownfield sites with their toxicity. Yeah, I would rather see a disincentive. I don't want to give them any relief in the tax rate. I'd rather see the brownfield sites be taxed at a higher rate to encourage development. So uh, actually setting a tax rate that is higher for unremediated toxic properties Sounds like a really good idea. I know. Yeah. So an unsightly uh, bylaw, I thought it was going to look after that in that years ago. Who gets to determine what unsightly is? And could we not say that's an unsightly premise and you have to clean it up? Well, uh, Robin's left the room, unfortunately. Because um, I think she well, might, might <laughs> <laughs> where. We're wondering, uh, the encyclic premises bylaw doesn't really allow us to make these abandoned sites any better. What could we put in terms of bylaw to help us um, force the beautification, at least the beautification of these, let alone to the remediation of these sites? I can start and <laughs> Robin can correct. <laughs> so, uh, the unsightly premises bylaw, we're actually working on some revisions uh, based on direction from council for uh, abandoned buildings or uh, vacant buildings is probably a better term. Uh, as far as vacant lots, the unsightly premises bylaw does speak to that. And, and it's really about the things uh, above the ground. The uh, brown fields and the, the correct determination or definition of the brown field is about the below the ground, and so the unsightly premises bylaw wouldn't uh, isn't isn't the appropriate bylaw for that. There needs to be uh, other pieces of legislation or other bylaws that speak to I think what uh, what I've heard council um, discussing today and council's intentions. Well, on the on that note, uh, there's I didn't think we were allowed chain link prints or exactly downtown. I didn't think we were allowed to put a chain link prints in our own piece of property. I didn't think that fit in the bio. Any lot in stored anything or anything had to have a solid a solid wooden fence or a fence that you could not see through. Chain so that relates to the DP area guidelines, which we apply at the development permit stage. A lot of the you know brownfield sites are have been chain linked for years uh, and they're sitting in that stage, so we wouldn't be able to do that. That. Um, but if, uh, if, for instance, a new site um, was going through vacancy and, and demolition and wanted to chain link the fence beyond what's required for demolition, 
then they would need to do landscaping buffer around that um, the perimeter of the site to, to buffer the chain link. Well, without getting into too fine of a discussion, I know that some of these subject properties are on Cleveland, which we've been having a lot of discussion about, but I mean, wouldn't one of the simplest things to do is to say, you know, identify all these properties and then just say that we density bonus two extra floors to get it done? I mean, that gives them the money right there to renew what the cost was uh, to remediate the site. That's probably the fastest. I mean, that's, that's obviously one tool. Um, just looking through some of these brownfield brown um, strategies that communities have, I think there's a lot of good ideas in terms of, of um, how to make this clearer in terms of our goals and our policies, and then uh, outline some strategic uh, initiatives that we could do to help encourage. Uh, I mean, there are sites that are leaching. We don't know they're leaching health hazards, we don't know their health hazards, you know, there's, there's a health imperative, there's a community imperative, a social imperative to get these sites cleaned up, let alone particularly strategic ones where there's real infill, you know, vibrancy, uh, you know, community objective goals that go along with it as well. So, um, you know, I think the first step is to get language in the OCP that's, that's targeting or specific to brownfields, <coughs> and then maybe in future budgets we actually, um, consider developing a brownfield policy that targets all this. And in the meantime, if there are some quick wins, if we want to try something out to see if we can stimulate a little bit of action on these these owners that have had brownfield sites for a long, long time, then you know we can do that in the meantime. But first step OCP, get the language in there, and maybe start looking at other communities in terms of what they're doing and work at a policy that Hopefully, be effective in targeting. Okay. Yeah. I apologize for saying this now, but when the 2000 plan was written in 1998, you're, you're not sorry. In the 1998, one of the action items, the number one action items in that plan was clean up that site. Fast forward 17 years. We can include Baseline, language. we need language in the OCP <coughs> set that will hopefully lead to a comprehensive uh, strategy on how to yes. encourage their remediation and ideally their redevelopment if they're particularly in strategic location. Okay, uh, that is all that's on the agenda. Um, there aren't any recommendations from the council. Round table or any suggestions for the next committee meeting? Yes, Doug. Um, and I forget the exact term of it, but this uh, middle, missing middle, missing middle. Um, discussion around that, I, I sort of feel the same way I felt about C10, like there might be different visions of what that is, um, and, um, and also, which is kind of connected to it, it's this idea or this concept of mixed forms of, typically as housing or residential within what area? Um, is it per block, per development, per neighborhood? Um, just to, uh, it's come up a couple of times, I think we all know, in, in recent um, applications. I don't, I think it's the same thing. We don't really have, we and therefore planning probably doesn't have an idea of what we're thinking, and, and nor does the investor community. Yeah, would we get everyone on the same page would be helpful. Okay, we'll add that. Yeah, Susan? Um, Two things. One thing, and I know we've had discussions on this before, but the more I, I sort of thought about it is monetizing our natural assets, and what brought this up is Polygon. It's a, you know, we don't really think about our natural assets and trail. We don't have a trail plan. We don't think about all the things in our community that we are. Have we have a trail. Well, we have our trail plan, but how do we value the rest of the stuff that's on? Private land, like the whole idea of our water system, our uh, parks, everything is until it's 
got an application on it, we don't know how to value it for the community. So uh, there's also what the community is doing monetization of the natural assets and understanding how natural assets. So um, quick discussion on that. And the other thing is decentralizing our parking. So uh, having you not using up our downtown for a centralized parking space, but the idea of moving our parking to where we can have a shuttle bus and having that shuttle bus access our, if we're going to actually move to a tourist-based economy, we need to have centralized parking and it has to go somewhere and it should be in some place where it's taking up economic development land. We don't have any land plan for it, so I'm thinking, you know, we should be on the lookout for some place in the industrial park that would all actually really fit well with AI in the future. So, so maybe we'll have a discussion on Maybe what we'll do is um, bring back the parking action plan that we did last year, a year ago, just to see where we are in terms of ticking off some of those boxes and then um, adding no, don't bring back parking. Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ted. I, I, I don't think we really finished our conversation on getting as much value out of the ADP as we can. I, think I felt that so we did have a brief discussion on the ADP and its role, but I think there's still a lot of mileage of having all those professionals and getting the advice from missing a lot of good advice from those guys on a lot of things. So, quick review about the ADP and our interface. They're mandated. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? I think we, we have a bit of an ongoing list. We ticked up a whole bunch off today. But things that we can get on the future agenda. Great. Um,